So we are in chapter 3.3, and this is going to be part 2. Uh, we have already spoke uh, a bit about the common cell morphologies of the eukaryotic, or of the prokaryotic organism. We've talked about different arrangements of them. Uh, we've talked about the cell wall and tonicity, and we've talked about some differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. And now we're going to get into some of the more unique characteristics of the prokaryotic cell. So we are going to start with the nucleoid region, or the nucleoid. And the reason that I say region is because really this is just a region. It's an area within the cell uh, where the DNA and the DNA-associated proteins are concentrated. So recall that in a eukaryotic organism, we have the actual nucleus. So we have a membrane uh, that's surrounding all of the DNA, all of the nuclear information, <clears throat> and the histones that are you know, have the DNA wrapped around them um, to condense them down and make them fit within that nucleus. Remember now that in a prokaryotic organism, we don't have that. We don't have the membrane-bound nucleus, which is why it's a prokaryotic organism. So this is the region in a prokaryotic cell where DNA and our DNA-associated proteins concentrate. So in this area, so if we have our, our cell, then remember we have our prokaryotic organism, our, our prokaryotic, prokaryotic chromosome, remember, is usually circular and haploid. So haploid meaning half of it, so it's unpaired. Unpaired, wow, um, chromosome. So then it would be in this kind of region here. So it's kind of wound around itself. Uh, again, it's a circular chromosome, haploid or unpaired, um, single-stranded. <clears throat> and then we have our DNA-associated proteins as well. So our DNA-associated associated proteins, which in this case are called our nucleoid-associated proteins, or NAPs, they are going to assist in the organization and the packaging of the chromosome. So similar to histones in our eukaryotic cells, these uh, nucleoid-associated proteins are going to be kind of like that, um, that protein that we take the DNA and we wrap the DNA around it <clears throat> so that we can get it into a smaller space, so that we can organize and package that chromosome so that we have our our. our protein, we wrap the DNA around it, then we have our next protein and we wrap the next chunk of DNA around it, and then we can wrap those proteins with DNA around the proteins with DNA and package the area, um, get it really, really, really small um, so that it doesn't get damaged, you know, so it's not interacting with other enzymes within the cell uh, so that as things come into the cell that might be damaging, they don't get damaged by it because it's all kind of wound up very closely. But it also organizes it because then when the organism needs to access a certain area or access certain genes, then it can just unwind that particular area, access that area, and then wind it back up to keep it safe. So these assist in the organization and packaging of chromosomes or of the chromosome. Well, I guess it's chromosomes because we're talking about nucleoid-associated proteins. So we're talking about multiple organisms here. So each organism has a chromosome uh, that is going to utilize these NAPs in order to package their chromosome. So again, it's, it's similar to histones. So histones in eukaryotic cells. Uh, so then if we talk about archaea, though, archaea, um, they have NAPs or histone-like DNA organizing proteins as well. So um, when we're talking about the nucleoid-associated proteins, um, the NAPs, these we're talking about um, prokaryotic organisms, but mainly we're talking about bacteria. Archaea also have NAPs or histone-like DNA organizing proteins. They're a little bit different, um, uh, but they have something similar so that we can make sure that we organize the DNA, make sure that it is safe. So they have NAPs or histone-like 
DNA organizing proteins as well. <clears throat> So that is our nucleoid region. When we're talking about chromosomes and we're talking about DNA in our prokaryotic organisms, again, we've already talked about the nucleoid region, which is where we find the main genetic information for the cell. But we need to also mention the other DNA in the cell, and that is in the plasmids. So a plasmid is a small circular double-stranded DNA molecule that is not contained in a chromosome. All right, so plasmids, as we saw in the image of a kind of general uh, bacteria or general uh, prokaryotic cell, are small, circular, stranded, uh, double-stranded DNA molecules that are not in that nucleoid region, that are floating around in the rest of the cytosol or the cytoplasm, and they have different functions. And we're going to get into much more detail throughout the semester as to the different functions and what we find on plasmids and how plasmids work. Um, but you do need to know that Prokaryotic organisms may or may not have plasmids, um, but they are able to have plasmids. So not all bacteria, for example, will have plasmids. Uh, some may have you know, dozens of plasmids, and some may have hundreds of plasmids, and some may have none. So uh, it really just depends on the environment that that particular bacterium or that particular prokaryotic organism was in and its interactions with other bacteria or other prokaryotic organisms in the area um, because they share these plasmids, and these plasmids can move from one bacterium to another bacterium. And oftentimes they do things like have um, antibiotic resistance on them, and that's how we end up having what are typically deemed superbugs, uh, quote, superbugs. And that's because they're sharing these plasmids. And as they're sharing these plasmids, they're passing them back and forth. And as they do that, they're sharing all of these um, genetic or all of these genes that are related to uh, antibiotic resistance. So the next part that we are going to talk about um, is something you should already be very familiar with, with eukaryotic organisms, and they are the ribosomes. Um, so similar to in eukaryotic organisms, there are structures that are responsible for protein synthesis, structures for protein synthesis, and they are um, constructed from proteins and rRNA. So, made up of proteins and rRNA. And recall that rRNA is ribosomal RNA. So just like in eukaryotic organisms, we have our proteins, we have our two different subunits, and then we have our ribosomal RNA that's kind of wound around um, and within those subunits. Uh, so our eukaryotic organisms, they have their cytoplasmic ribosomes are ADS ribosomes. Uh, and that ADS is related to the weight when centrifuging. Uh, so we can put the cells, we can break apart the cells and we can put them in a centrifuge. And that centrifuge is going to break them apart into their pieces based on certain types of weight measurements, for example. Um, our eukaryotic ribosomes are ADS. Our prokaryotic are 70S ribosomes. Um, so they still do have the two subunits, <clears throat> but together, you know, they have the they have a 50S subunit and a 30S subunit. And although 50 plus 30 does not equal 70, it's because of the way that it centrifuges out. So they have a 70S subunit. And the reason that this is mentioned specifically, and you do need to know the difference between eukaryotic being 80S and prokaryotic being 70S, is because as we move into things like taking a specific look at antibiotic resistance um, and our antibiotics that we have come up with, we are going to be talking specifically about the differences between the 80S and the 70S and how we can develop drugs uh, associated with killing bacteria because what we can do 
when we are developing antibiotics, for example, we need to look at the differences between our own cells, our eukaryotic cells, and the cells that we're trying to get rid of or, or eliminate, which would be bacterial cells, for example, or other prokaryotic cells. And so we need to look at the differences between these cells, which is why here in this chapter, first of all, we're going through these differences, and then we will throughout the semester be looking even closer at these differences. Um, because once we get to the sections on antibi antibiotics, then we can see where we are going to be utilizing utilizing different pharmaceuticals to uh, kind of attack these bacteria, for example. So one example is some of our antibacterials are going to attack or, or adjust or affect the 70S ribosome uh, or ribosome altogether. So the, either one of those subunits, and, and we'll talk about the differences, but the reason that that will work as an antibiotic and it doesn't harm our own cells in this way is because our ribosomes are ADS. Um, so we can kind of get what we're looking for without harming our own cells by focusing on the differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And this is one of those differences. Uh, whereas all cells have ribosomes, we have a difference in the specific ribosomes. And then we also have our archaeal. Ribosomes. And they are also 70S. But they're different because their proteins and the RNA are more similar to our eukaryotic organisms. So uh, the, not DNA, the proteins and RNA are similar to eukaryotic. So again, archaea are more similar to eukaryotic organisms in many ways than they are to other prokaryotic organisms like bacteria, for example. Um, so we're seeing some of those differences as well. All right, so we have now spoken about ribosomes, we've spoken about plasmids, we've also spoken about the nucleoid or the nucleoid region. Now the next one that we're going to take a look at are inclusions. So this is one where it is very different from eukaryotic organisms because we don't really have inclusions. We have some things that are similar, some different vesicles, um, but inclusions themselves are specific to our prokaryotic organisms. So what they are are cytoplasmic structures that store excess nutrients in polymer form, in polymer form. <clears throat> and so this is important because this is a real advantage for bacteria, for example. They can take the polymer form and store it up in these inclusions, which are basically these cytoplasmic structures. So they have these um, plasma membranes that will store the nutrients inside of them in this polymer form, meaning the long chain or the more complex form. And what it does is, if it stores them away in these inclusions, if a bacteria does this, then it's going to reduce the buildup of stuff inside the cytoplasm that's going to contribute to osmotic pressure. Um, so the organism is going to kind of sequester away these different things in these little uh, vesicles, in these little tiny droplets. And then that way it's not going to be floating around freely within the cytoplasm, therefore changing the osmotic pressure of the cell and then changing what we had spoken about in the last uh, portion of chapter 3.3, which would be the tonicity. Um, so these, uh, let's see, we can see the advantages here is that it reduces buildup. of osmotic pressure when the cell accumulates more solutes. So for example, some of them store glycogen. So glycogen is our storage energy, our storage molecule for energy for glucose. Uh, so we have long chains of glycogen. We as humans store glycogen in our liver so that we can go to it for long term um, or for like a burst of energy. If we haven't eaten for a while, we can go to our liver and break down our glycogen. And bacteria can do the same thing, except they go to their inclusions and they can start to break down the glycogen for energy. And also they can do the same thing with starches, just like we can store glucose from starches. Uh, they can store starch as well. Um, we don't store it in exactly the same form, but 
um, they can store starch and they can go in and they can grab that for energy. So there are various types of inclusions that you need to be familiar with. <clears throat> so one is a volutin granule. So a, a volutin granule. In this case, what it is, it's an inclusion that stores inorganic phosphate. Uh, and then this inorganic phosphate is going to be used in metabolism. So similar to breaking down glycogen or breaking down starch, um, this, these organisms that have volutin granules can take this inorganic phosphate and then use that in their metabolism. They can also use it in biofilms. So they contain inorganic phosphate used in metabolism and biofilms. So they can use this phosphate when they're building biofilms, which we'll talk a lot more about in a future chapter, and then also breaking it down for energy or part of their metabolism. The second one that you should know are sulfur granules. So sulfur granules, as their name implies, they store elemental sulfur. Elemental sulfur. And again, this is used for metabolism. So used for metabolism as part of their breaking down and building up molecules. So some other granules, for example, are PHB granules or polyhydroxybutyrate. PHB, polyhydroxybutyrate, um, are surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer that is infused with proteins. Um, and we, as humans, actually have been able to utilize some of these inclusions that are made um, in various applications. <clears throat> so one example is the, the PHB. So these are surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer, and it is infused with proteins. And so then we can utilize some of those proteins in those granules. Uh, some other inclusions, so we have volutin, sulfur, PHB. There are also gas vacuoles. So gas vacuoles are, as the name implies, filled with gas filled with different gases, and these are used for buoyancy. So they can increase the amount of gas that are inside of these vacuoles so that they become lighter and they can float up closer to the surface of the water, um, or they can let out some of the gas from these vacuoles. So it's kind of like a swim bladder where they can fill it up and then they can let it out, and they can adjust their buoyancy utilizing these gas vacuoles and how much or how little gas are actually inside of them. Uh, another one, magnetosomes or magnetosomes. Uh, these contain iron oxide or iron sulfide. And these are important, similar to the gas vacuoles, where we can fill it up with gas or we can let the gas out and we can adjust buoyancy or where one is located. With the magnetosomes, what they're doing is they're utilizing the iron oxide and the iron sulfide that's stored within those magnetosomes to align themselves. So align along a magnetic field. So another way that these bacteria can actually move and figure out where they want to go and, and how they can get there utilizing these magnetosomes or magnetosomes. The last one that you need to be aware of are the carb carboxosomes. So these contain enzymes used for carbon metabolism. So enzymes used for carbon metabolism. So again, similar to the volutin granules that are going to store up that inorganic phosphate and use it for metabolism, or sulfur granules utilizing that for metabolism, carboxosomes are going to have enzymes that are used for carbon metabolism. 
so that when carbon is available, all of the enzymes that are necessary for utilizing that carbon are all contained inside of a carboxysome. They can open it up, and then they're right there available for utilizing carbon in their metabolism. All right, so these are the six types of inclusions that you should be familiar with uh, that we can find in prokaryotic organisms. The next topic are endospores. So endospores we've already spoken a little bit about um, because we talked about our endospore stain um, in the second chapter. <clears throat> so recall that endospores are structures that are going to protect the bacterial genome. Uh, this is a dormant state. And then when it's not dormant, it's called vegetative. So the vegetative cells are actually going to go through the process of making an endospore when the environment is unfavorable. So when it finds itself in an environment that's not really great for it, then it's going to go through the process of making an endospore, kind of get rid of the excess stuff and just have this really strong, really... Um, really difficult to eradicate endospore that then has its genetic information stored for a later time when it finds itself in a more suitable environment for it to go into, go back into a vegetative cell and then start to make copies of itself. So endospores are structures that protect the bacterial genome in a dormant state when the environment is unfavorable. So again, when it finds itself in a situation that's not really great for its metabolism, rather than dying, uh, these particular bacteria will make endospores. And some of the characteristics of endospores is that they are resistant to extreme temperatures and radiation. So this makes it really difficult to get rid of endospores because again, extreme temperatures. So increasing the temperature, burning, burning hot, um, will not kill or get rid of an endospore. Same thing with radiation. We can irradiate food, we can irradiate um, various things, but that's not going to get rid of all of the endospores. So a vegetative cell is typically sensitive to these types of things. If it's a living, metabolizing vegetative cell, increasing the temperature would kill it off, or uh, depending on the bacterium, but most bacterium, especially those that we find near us that can make us sick, for example, uh, would be killed off in extreme temperatures as well as with radiation. However, that's not the case with endospores. Um, endospores do not absorb gram stain. And we know that already. That's why we have our special endospore stain. An endospore is dehydrated. There is no metabolic activity. So when we say a vegetative cell, what we're talking about is a cell that has metabolic activity. So it has water, it's got the cytoplasm in it, and it's going through its enzymatic activities. It's breaking down carbon or whatever it happens to do, you know, breaking down carbon, breaking down sulfur, phosphate, whatever it does, it's going through its typical metabolic processes. It's alive, it's, you know, eating, it eliminating and making copies of itself. An endospore, however, is not doing any of those things. It's a very dehydrated, um, not really even organism, it's a very dehydrated piece of an organism that's been created, and it doesn't have any metabolic activity. It's, it's in a dormant state, and it's just waiting for those in, environments, uh, or waiting for its environment to get better. <clears throat> so it is dormant, and so again, no metabolic activity. And so therefore, no growth versus a vegetative cell, which is of course doing those things, going through um, metabolism, utilizing its metabolism to break things down, build things up, and it's growing and making copies of itself. So let's take a quick look at sporulation. So sporulation 
is the process where vegetative cells are going to transform into endospores. So process by which vegetative cells transform into endospores. So let's take a look at that process. So in step one, we are going to replicate the DNA. So very first step, the vegetative cell finds itself in a situation where it's not happy. Let's say it is a particular type of bacterium that requires a moist environment. It has now found itself in a dry environment. And so it says, I need to go through sporulation so that I can find myself later in a better environment because this will kill me if I don't sporulate. So it goes into sporulation. Step number one, it's going to replicate the DNA. It wants a brand new copy of DNA just off the press uh, so that that brand new, most perfect copy of DNA that hasn't been damaged yet um, can then be a part of the endospore. So that is step one. In step two, then, we have the formation of a septum. <clears throat> and this is going to separate the four spore from the mother cell or the rest of the vegetative cell. So the formation of the septum. And then this is going to separate the four spore. from the mother cell. All right, so we start to form this septum, which is kind of like in um, cytokinesis. In cytokinesis, when we are kind of pulling in those sides and, and clipping the cells off into two, except in this case, what we're doing is separating the endospore, or in this, eventually what will be the endospore, <clears throat> Uh, from the rest of the cell, from the vegetative part part of the cell. So then what we have is in step three, we have other membranes that are formed around the four spore. Form around four spore. And all of this is shown in an image in your text. So in step one, for example, they show there's the DNA, and then we have the copy of DNA that's kind of sequestered in the corner there. Uh, and then it shows the septum, so we have the DNA over here, and then we have the replicated DNA there, and you can see that the septum is going to start to pull in, as we said here. Uh, then in step three, you can see that we have our cell, we have the DNA over here, the DNA over here, and then what we've done is we have these membranes that are now forming around the four spore. And then in step four, we have a cortex that is forming or is formed around the four spore. And then this cortex is made up of calcium, um, some membrane, and dipiclinic. Sorry, let me write that out better here. Dipicolinic acid. <clears throat> so then in this case, what we have is we have our DNA over here, our DNA here. We have a membrane that's formed, um, multiple membranes. And then we have our cortex, which is a little bit thicker, um, made up of membrane and calcium and dipicolinic acid. And then what we have is our next step. So step four or step five. In step five, then we have a protein layer that is going to coat this four spore. So a protein layer coats four spore. This is an outer exosporium. So in this case, then what we do is we add our very last layer, which is this protein coat. <clears throat> this protein coat is very, very thick. Uh, so in our illustration here, we have the DNA, then we have membranes here, then we have the cortex. And then lastly, we add our protein coat all along the outside. Then in step six, 
then the endospore is going to be released. And then the mother cell disintegrates. So then all of this is going to disintegrate and then what we have left here is our endospore. And then again, that's going to withstand very high temperatures and radiation and dehydration and uh, pressure. Uh, it basically withstands most anything that we can try to apply to it. And then once that endospore finds itself in a situation that is beneficial for it, so maybe in an area that has more moisture, or less pressure, or something like that, then it can go through the process of germination. When it goes through the process of germination, this is when the endospore is going to change back into a vegetative cell. So process by which endospore turns back into a vegetative cell. All right, so that is the process of sporulation and then getting out of you know that process. So the reverse would be germination. So going from an endospore to a vegetative cell. So note, however, that sporulation and endospores are different than spores like the um, seeds that come from ferns, for example. So there's some plants that have spores on them and the spores are the reproductive parts of particular plants, but these are different. So these are endospores, sometimes shortened to the word spore, but it's different because these aren't seeds that are then spread to make more copies of themselves, like plants, for example. In this case, this is um, something that can withstand an unfavorable environment and then hang out until it is in a favorable environment and then can germinate so that we can have a vegetative cell again, which can then metabolize things and then make copies of itself. All right, so the next structure is the plasma membrane. And when we talk about the plasma membrane, you should be familiar with the plasma membrane already with your study and understanding of eukaryotic organisms. Um, so when we talk about uh, plasma membrane, really what that is is a part of the cell envelope. Um, when we say cell envelope, what we're talking about are all the structures that include or that enclose uh, the cytoplasm and the internal structures of a cell. Uh, and the reason that we use cell envelope is because that, that can include a cell wall. Um, all cells have a plasma membrane as part of their cell envelope. Uh, some of them also have cell walls. So our cell envelope are all structures that enclose the cytoplasm and internal structures of the cell. All right, so all cells have a plasma membrane as part of their cell envelope. And so the plasma membrane is the structure that encloses the cell. And remember that it has selective permeability. So selective permeability, meaning that some molecules can go through the plasma membrane and some cannot. So some move through, some do not. So selectively permeable, it can select what moves through and what does not, what it's permeable to. Um, also remember that a plasma membrane is a fluid mosaic. It's also oftentimes called fluid mosaic model. And so remember that this means that the components of the plasma membrane are allowed to move fluidly within the plane of the membrane. So uh, they can kind of move around and bump into each other in the plane of the membrane. Um, and then when you look down on it, it's like a mosaic. We have all of these different parts of the plasma membrane, which you should be familiar with. So those, those integral proteins, which are the proteins that move or that um, are throughout both layers of the membrane, so the, the bilayers, uh, also called transmembrane proteins. We also have peripheral proteins, and we have the um, phospholipids, and we have the cholesterol, and all of these different pieces are allowed to move fluidly. So move fluidly within the plane 
of the membrane. And then there are many lipid and protein components. So if we remember some of them, we have our phospholipids. Remember, phospholipids are the main component of the plasma membrane. We also have various types of proteins. So we have our transmembrane proteins, also called integral proteins. And we have our peripheral proteins. So if we um, think about our plasma membrane, remember we have our phospholipids, which are, which have their fatty acids, and then remember that this is bilayer. This is very, very loose here. And so then we have our integral or our transmembrane proteins, which can move throughout, or is rather going across both layers here. And then we can have our peripheral proteins, which would be a protein that's on one side. Uh, our phospholipids, our proteins. We also have our cholesterol. So cholesterol is a four-carbon four ring structure uh, that is also movable within the plasma membrane. So we have lots of those throughout. And then we also have other pieces like our glycoproteins and glycolipids. So protein with our glycogen chain on top or carbohydrate chain on top or our whoops, glycolipids. So we'll have our tails here and then we have our carbohydrate chain attached to that. So cholesterol, our glycoproteins, our glycolipids. So remember, glyco is related to the carbohydrate and then proteins and lipids. So these are all different parts of our plasma membrane. So you should be familiar with those different parts and, and kind of what they are, what they look like, um, and what they do in the plasma membrane. Now, we'll, typically, our phospholipid bilayer has ester linkages. Um, so typically, we have ester linkages in our phospholipids. Now, when we talk about archaea, uh, if we talk about archaeal membranes, they are a bit different than our bacterial and our eukaryotic membranes. So for one, the phospholipids are formed with ether linkages. So we just mentioned that we have ester linkages. Those are usually our phospholipid bilayer linkages in both uh, eukaryotic organisms as well as bacteria. In archaea, we have uh, ether linkages between those phospholipids or within those phospholipids. Um, also, the phospholipids in archaea have branched chains. Typically, they have straight chains. So we think of our phospholipid as they can kind of be kinky, but they're straight rather than branched, meaning they actually have different branches coming off of them uh, rather than the straight chains. And then three, some can have lipid monolayers. So rather than the bilayer, it will have a lipid monolayer. Um, so we see that difference. We don't see that in bacteria. We don't see that in eukaryotic organisms, but we can see that in our archaea. So then recall that our glycoproteins and glycolipids can vary a lot. Um, so these vary a lot, and they what they also do, and we'll talk about this in more detail, but they allow for classification. And they extend out from that membrane surface. So we had our plasma lipid there, and then remember we have our, our chains that come off. 
um, that are part of our glycoprotein, so the protein and then the glycolipids. <clears throat> And so the way that those glycoproteins or the glycolipids uh, extend off of that cell membrane, so this would be the exterior of the cell and this would be the interior, is what's going to allow for different classifications of organisms. So they vary a lot, and we're going to talk more about this in detail uh, in the future, but this is one way that we can identify certain organisms. So when we're talking about creating those phylogenetic trees, then this is one way that we can do that. We can take a look at their phospholip or their um, glycoproteins and glycolipids to be able to identify them. So now when we're speaking about all of these different parts of the plasma membrane, we just need to keep in mind some of these um, transport mechanisms um, when we're talking about the plasma membrane. So you should be familiar with these already as well because when you have learned about eukaryotic plasma membranes, you should have gone through and learned things like passive transport, for example. So recall that, <clears throat> excuse me, recall that passive transport means that no energy is used to transport a molecule through the plasma membrane. So what we're talking about here are transport mechanisms. So in passive transport, we're talking about there's no energy being put into it. It's just passively moving across, right? And so this is where we have a diffusion of molecules across the membrane due to the concentration gradient. Um, so we have a diffusion across plasma, plasma membrane. due to the concentration gradient. And so what we're talking about here, if it's passive transport, we're saying that things are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, right? So if we have a whole bunch of stuff in one area, it moves across the plasma membrane to the area of lower concentration. And that we have two types of passive transport. We have simple diffusion, and we have facilitated diffusion. So remember that simple diffusion has no help from cell structures. Whereas facilitated diffusion is going to use channels that allow diffusion to happen faster. So use channels, and these channels are often made up of proteins to allow diffusion faster. And then we have our active transport. And remember that active transport, active meaning that you have to put energy into the system. So in this case, it requires energy. And so then this is when cells are going to move large molecules or charged molecules across the plasma membrane against the concentration gradient. So this is against the concentration gradient. And so what that means is that we are moving things from an area of low concentration to areas of high concentration. Mm -hmm. So against that gradient. And so then what this means is that it requires channels. Right? So channels or carrier proteins, etc. So we have to move this against its will, so move it into an area of higher concentration, uh, utilizing energy and utilizing things like carriers or channels. And these are oftentimes going to be large molecules or charged. Because remember that this is a phospholipid membrane, so lipids are nonpolar. If we're going to be moving something that's polar across the plasma membrane, oftentimes this requires active transport. Now, these should be familiar to you. One that may not be familiar to you is group translocation. And really, all this is is that when we move molecules into a cell against the concentration gradient, on its way in, it gets chemically modified so that it no longer requires transport against the concentration gradient. Um, so we uh, chemically modify molecules when transported 
against the concentration gradient. And so then it no longer requires transport uh, against the gradient. So an example of this is the phosphotransferase system. So in this system, what happens is as it's moving across the plasma membrane, some of the proteins, some of the enzymes in the area actually add a phosphate group to a glucose molecule. And then what that does is it changes the structure of that glucose molecule, and then it no longer needs to be transported against its concentration gradient. All right, so... The last little piece here of the plasma membrane that we're going to mention are our photosynthetic membrane structures. And the reason that we're going to mention them related to the plasma membrane is because they are an infolding of the plasma membrane. So we have our photosynthetic membrane structures. So our photosynthetic membrane structures, these are an infolding of the plasma membrane. That encloses photosynthetic pigments. So, for example, chlorophylls, bacterial chlorophylls, um, these types of pigments then are found in things like cyanobacteria or photosynthetic bacteria, and then they're going to take in the energy of the sun and utilize the, the energy that comes from the sun in order to go through its metabolic processes. And we're going to talk about that in more detail, um, but right now you just need to know that there are photosynthetic membrane structures that are in infolding of this plasma membrane, and then in cyanobacteria, they are called thylakoids. Again, they're an infolding of the plasma membrane in photosynthetic bacteria. They are chromatophores. lamellae, or chlorosomes. So they're called different things um, in the bacteria and the cyanobacteria, but basically they are photosynthetic structures, meaning that they take the light from the sun, convert it into energy within the organism. All right, so I'm going to wrap up this one here, and we are going to have a part three to the chapter 3.3 .3 section where we're going to take a look, or a closer look at the cell wall uh, and the components of it and some other different structures of cells. Uh, so in this one, remember that we talked a lot about the plasma membrane, uh, its permeability, the difference with archaeal membranes, and different transport mechanisms and the photosynthetic structures. We talked about endospores and the sporulation process. We talked about the different types of inclusions that you should be familiar with. We also uh, spoke about ribosomes, plasmids, and then the nucleoid region. Uh, so in the next section, we're going to finish up chapter 3.3. .3.